All right, there we go. Anybody know what movie that was? I'm gonna shut that off right there. Anybody know what movie that was tonight? How's everybody doing, by the way? It's a beautiful February 21st, 2018 in Madeira Beach, Florida. Hello, Stephanie. Got in on time tonight. Remember what day of the week it was. <laughs> Kelly, Andrea. Nicole, Lois, didn't know what uh, movie that was. Anybody want to take a shot at what that movie was? Uh, for those, hey, Charlie, how are you? Good. Hello, Andrew. Yeah, you're here on time as well. I see. I noticed. I see you. I'm doing good, Lois. It was, uh, had a little bit of a tough weekend on the disc golf course, but besides that, um, everything's good. A lot of positive things are going on here. Um, but my disc golf game this weekend was not good. No, very bad. Um, but I'm doing great. No, no complaints besides that. Just have to work. Just have to work at my game a little bit stronger, uh, a little bit longer, and stronger and harder. Um, anybody want to take a guess at the movie? Now, some of you getting in here, you don't even know what I'm talking about now. I have to tell you, I was going to be do a little bit different thing for the pre-show tonight, but it didn't quite work out. I was going to play uh, some music off of my laptop and see if any of you could guess what it was, but my laptop microphone just won't pick up its own speakers. Go figure. So, um, no, it was not. No, Stephanie, it was not an old Western. No. So I was going to play some music. The, 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 the microphone just wouldn't pick it up. So I had to give that up. Maybe I'll work on that for next week. No, the music was this. Uh, Angela, how are you? Here's what the movie was in the pre-show tonight. I'm going to type it out. If I can do this. There it is. That's what the movie was for tonight. I love that movie. I think the beginning of that movie where they are discovering those airplanes and uh, the mystery of it and that ship being out in the middle of the desert. Uh, 
fascinating movie. I think one of Steven Spielberg's best movies, as a matter of fact. Love it. That's what it was, Stephanie. That was the part where Richard Dreyfuss is in the station wagon. He's trying to get to Devil's Tower. Uh, that's what uh, scene was playing there. Um, so there you go. Um, yep. And hello, Dorothy. How are you? And Kelly, how are you doing tonight? So we got a good show. Uh, I've got a good show planned out. Um, like I said, I've got my little outline here, of what I want to, want to talk about tonight. And please get in your questions. I think Stephanie was the only one who submitted uh, to me a question before we um, before we got started tonight. So if anybody has any questions about anything, keep it PG rated. Uh, we'll be good. Uh, Stephanie says, there are dead flies in my mashed potatoes. I love that line in the movie. I remember that. But I always met, already mentioned that I did not have a very good disc golf weekend. It was beautiful down here, but I didn't play well. Going to have to practice a little more when I have the time, which I don't have a lot of time these days. Um, I need to mention that uh, this weekend, the second article that I uh, assisted on for uh, TribLive.com, Trib Total Media, Tribune Review in Pittsburgh, it will be coming out this Sunday. Um, the writer that I'm working with, Stephen Huba, uh, went over and talked to the sister of, hello, Joyce, how are you? Um, we are went over and spoke to the sister of Tony Lynn McNatt Chiapetta. She was a 14-year-old who disappeared in Clareton, Pennsylvania, which is a, just outside Pittsburgh, uh, in November 1981. And that is the article uh, that will be in the Sunday's paper. I'll, of course, be linking to it. Uh, and all the places that Unfound is, and um, you will hear my, just like we did last month when I interviewed Steven at the end of an episode, uh, he will, uh, we already conducted the interview, already recorded it, it will be at the end of Friday's episode. This week's disappearance is the disappearance of Rebecca Henderson Polk, who disappeared from Alabama, although her car was found in Mississippi in 2015, but at the end of that episode, you will hear my interview with Stephen, where we talk a little bit about media and technology, and then we move right into talking a little bit about the disappearance of Tony McNatt Chiapetta in Clareton, Pennsylvania in 1981. So um, the, uh, there we go with that. Just wanted to give you a heads up. Joyce asked me, what is your take on the five-year-old missing stepmom arrested? Uh, Joyce, I'm going to have to tell you, I don't know anything about that story. I don't uh, miss that. If that's a story within the last few days or something, I apologize. Missed a working on Friday's program. Uh, haven't caught a lot of news. I have a couple news items that I do want to talk about for um, tonight's show, but that is a story that I missed, unfortunately. So uh, I, I'm just not sure about that. Um you know, one thing that we haven't talked about, and this will get right into the program, uh, is, hello, Christina. Glad you could join tonight. Um, I did a little bit of a rundown, but uh, welcome uh, tonight. Um, I suppose after a year and a half, <laughs> uh, it's probably time for me to talk about why psychics are never mentioned on Unfound. The reason I bring this up is because a recent guest on Unfound uh, brought, uh, emailed me today and was asking me something about it. And we just had a short exchange with, with it. Um, why, why don't we mention them? Um, probably the biggest reason, because I, I know in other true crime podcasts, psychics get a, a, a fair amount of attention. Of attention. Uh, you know that there are many police departments sometimes who uh, – all you know is that psychics come a lot, a lot in true crime. Whether it's a disappearance or murder, those are usually the two, two most common instances that uh, psychics kind of pop up. I am not a believer in psychics, but I want you to know that does not – that is not the main reason – that we don't talk about them on Unfound, all right? My personal beliefs about how the world works, 
whether are there are powers like that or anything like that, that is not the main reason. It's one of the reasons, but it is not the main reason. All right, I, I want you to know that I'm the type of guy, I don't believe in UFOs, I don't believe in ghosts. That's just my worldview, okay? And Rachel, welcome tonight. Thank you for joining uh, the audience. Um, the reason, you know, I'm a very, you know, lot, you probably already know this, very logical, very rational, um, very facts-oriented, information-oriented, uh, doing things that work type of guy. I think that's that's the way Unfound tries to be. And hello, Jem Jem. Thank you for joining tonight. The problem I have with psychics is that, see, you know, if psychics were actually knowledgeable, if they actually worked, and I, I, I'm not saying that all of them are frauds or anything else. In fact, I believe many of them believe that they have very uh, special powers. All right, I, I don't have any doubt about that. I do believe there are frauds out there, but I believe a, a lot of them also believe that um, they think that they have powers. And far be it from me to tell them that they don't. All right, I wouldn't want somebody telling me that I can't do something. So I'm not going to tell somebody else that, no, they're full of it, you know, and something like that. The problem I have is that they have no record of success. All right, and that is the number one point. And the corollary to that, and see what happens is that, as you've heard on the program with the people that I've talked to, and of course Joyce is in here tonight, she knows. Um, parents or any family members, they are desperate to get answers. And even if they generally in their regular life maybe don't believe in that thing. They don't want to pass up any opportunity, such as a psychic, who might just happen to be a legitimate one that may be able to help. That, that's, that I've had those conversations with people off the program about that. And they feel guilty if they don't entertain every single resource that exists on this earth, even if it means Ouija boards and psychics and tarot cards and whatever else, okay? And I'm not here to judge those people. The problem starts, though, when it puts police and detectives in a very, very difficult position. My belief is that probably most police departments, most detectives don't believe in any of that stuff, all right? They're experienced people investigating missing persons, robberies, murders, and they know what solves crimes. Evidence, DNA, forensics, video cameras, things like that. But what it does is when psychics get involved, it forces them in a position, into a position where they have to listen to these people. Why? Because families listen to these people, and police don't want to put themselves in a position where they tell a family, no, we're not going to do that because we don't believe in it, all right? The police are not going to do that. Now, that puts them in a very um, complex position because on one hand, they don't believe in it, so they don't want to do it, but on the other hand, they're worrying, well, what's it going to look like if the family wants us to take the psychic seriously and we don't? And what it ends up doing is, all, what it ends up happening is all of this stuff that psychics would say, well, I see a body down by a river, and I see that your daughter was picked up by a guy driving a red car, whatever. Then the police are forced to follow all of these leads. And that's why I don't like psychics. They have no history of success, but then on the other hand, the police are kind of forced to go along with them and following these leads because otherwise it makes them look bad, all right? When the police could be doing probably real detective work. We already know that missing persons cases don't get enough attention from police it is, as it is. We've heard all of the, the, the dismissive statements that detectives and police have made to families 
over the course of the last year and a half. Almost every family has a story like that. On top of that, you don't want police having to go off into the hinterlands chasing, you know, rumors and chasing something just because somebody thinks they have a special power. Hello, Greg. Uh, you uh, jumped into um, our, our discussion here on my discussion on psychics. And I just, you know, I really haven't talked about this. Psychics don't come up in the program on purpose. And I think I thought it was about time to say why. And Dorothy, U.S. military uses them in some capacity. Well, you know, uh, once again, uh, you know, any battle that the United States has ever gone into, we lose people. So, I, you know, it would be nice if the psychics could stop getting our soldiers, you know, killed. You know, if they're going to say, I, I know the U.S. military, I, I know the CIA at one point was really deep into that and everything else, but there's a reason we build satellites instead. There's a reason we have spy planes. There's a reason we have military. We don't rely on psychics to defend the United States. So uh, I just think that psychics waste a lot of police's time, the police time. And that's the main reason that I don't uh, talk about them. And I will tell you that uh, some of my guests have wanted to talk about them, and I just say we can't. We just can't do that. All right? Uh, and I explained to them why. And I think that I've made an impact on at least some of them regarding that. Regarding that. Um, I'm not, once again, I am not getting in the way of their world beliefs. All right? I don't care about the religion or, or anything else. Um, but I am not going to talk about things on the program that I think are getting in the way of solving cases. And, le and lend creed. I mean, we talk about things that get in the way of solving cases, but anything um, that something is somebody's trying to legitimize that doesn't work, that hasn't proven to work. That's the reason we don't talk about psychics. Um, you know, uh, Kelly Murphy has a great uh, um as a great recording of her experience, of course, Jason Jokowski's mother about all of this. And she did a whole seminar on it at one time. And uh, cause she got early on when Jason disappeared, uh, she entertained some psychics. She didn't want to family members wanted her to. And it, uh, it of course went nowhere because all these years later, Jason is still not found. Um, and it's just, uh, that's why we don't do it, all right? It's just not because I don't personally believe in them. It's because, and I don't, you know, and that's why he says, you know, family will say to me, well, they're not, I'm going to talk to the psychic, but they're not charging me anything. And I know, I know that sounds fine. And you say, well, what's the harm? You know, you're getting it for free. But the thing is, anything that comes out of that psychic's mouth, the police are going to practically be forced to look into um and that's a problem you know there are only so many hours in a day days in a week for these uh cases to be investigated for the police to go off uh you know chasing thing you know visions from people who have never solved any crimes so that's my reason all right if anybody asks you and it ever comes up anything like that uh i uh, you know people i know we talk about people that believe in prayer and, and all of these things, and that's fine. But praying and believing in a God and hoping that you know he or she or it is going to solve a crime, that's not getting in the way of what police do. That's not taking up the police's time. Whereas I think psychics and, and things have taken up uh, the police a lot of police time. If you were to add up all the hours. Um, it'd be quite a bit. So I just wanted to state that. And I, I'm sorry that if I offended anybody with that, but I thought it was about time that we talk about it. And uh, that's just the way it is. So there you go on that. Any 
any insight? I know Dory's, you know, any insight into any of that? Um, and just thought it was about time that I talk about it. It's my, Christina says, that's my favorite thing about your podcast. You're doing facts, signs, measurable, calculable information. I try to. And Joyce says, of course, Joyce, having lost the two daughters to a disappearance, you and I think the same on psychics. And Joyce, you know, I, I know that uh, psychics have approached you over the last almost 40 years. You know, they haven't been able to offer much, unfortunately. I wish they had. I mean, don't get me wrong. I wish if, if psychics were real, I'd be right with all of you. If they were helping people and missing people were being found and everything, even though I necessarily wouldn't believe that it's it, but there would be proof. All right, there would be proof. Just no proof. It's just no proof. Has one or two people got lucky once in a while? Uh, I guess so. But I, I just cannot devote any. Uh, that's why I'm going to devote time talking about it on this show and instead of the, the podcast because I just don't want to waste any time on the podcast talking about it. I more want to talk about the people that the missing person knew, what was going on in the missing person's life, uh, the forensics, the, the videotape, bank records, cell phone records, all of those things, the kind of uh, things that I think are more tangible that have shown uh, to, to solve cases. So there you go. Uh, let's uh, get the little business stuff out of the way. We're going to remind you, you can find the books on Amazon.com, uh, both Volume 1 and Volume 2, both in ebook and print form. MakePlayingCards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound is for the playing cards. Got a lot of cases on there now, along with all of the Texas cases. I'm going to, when I have time, maybe this weekend, being that I won't be in a disc golf tournament, I'll be putting uh, decks together according to the K, uh, to states. So all the California cases in one deck, all the Florida cases in one deck. I think that might be interesting. And then finally, the unfound dash podcast dot my shopify.com all the shirts and i'm going to be adding some things there and see that's the other thing about playing a disc golf tournament on a weekend i can't get uh, a lot of this extra work done um because uh, usually on the weekends is when i work on the extra stuff that's when i work on merchandise stuff that's when i work on the book stuff other things that uh i do for the program for the podcast and so when i play a disc golf tournament on the weekend it gets in the way of that so uh, I have to keep that in mind for the future. Um, Lois says, I think you're right about that. I think referencing the psychics. And then Dorothy says, if it worked, we would not have so many missing. That's exactly right. I mean, we all know. We don't know what the exact number is. But we know that it's a huge number of people who are missing, just for example, in the United States. I don't want to be a U.S.-centric show, but that's where I live. And... Uh, no answers. I mean, thousands and thousands of people are missing. You know, let's get some answers. If any psychic wants to try to prove to me that they can solve a missing persons case, they can come down to Madeira Beach. We'll talk about it. And she, he or she can tell me where a missing person is. We'll just do it. Just get it done. No problem. Uh, on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. I thank all of the contributors uh, to this program. I cannot thank you enough. And of course, Unfound also has a PayPal account. You can go on to PayPal and just go uh, find unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. And I would deeply appreciate that as well. Jill, welcome tonight. How are you doing? Hope you're doing well. And the Unfound newsletter. Uh, got, us, got a lot of responses to that. People seem to like it. Like it. If you're not on the list, if you think you're on the list, and did not get one, um, then you might want to talk, check your spam folder. That came out like a week ago, I guess, or something like that now. You might want to check your spam folder. Um, but if you aren't on the list and you want to be on the list, just email me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com, and I will put you on the list. And we have about 400 people on there, so that's nice. Joe, you're doing good. Uh, I'm glad to hear it. Great. Um, so we got all went through all the business stuff. Let's get back to a little true crime news. Um, if you noticed, there was that Uber driver in California who was missing. That seemed to get a lot of uh, national attention. 
Uh, how many of you saw that? I'm guessing a lot of you saw that story. He had, was missing for a little over the a week. He was found not too far from where his car was found, and I think that the police came up to him. He seemed to be a little out of it, and so the police took him uh, to a hospital, and he's being looked at. I, I think it's probably a little too early to say what actually happened. Uh, Lois, you saw that story. Um, it's, you know, he worked for both Uber and Lyft, I should say. Uber and Lyft driver. Joshua Thede, T-H-I-E-D-E, -E, Thede, is that how you pronounce his name? Uh, he was found uh, on Feb February 19th, so that would be two days ago. Now, hello, Ann. I didn't see you in here. Hello. I Sorry, I didn't say hi to you. Um, how are you doing? Um, he was missing for over a week. But it seems that uh, he was found, although mentally he was not doing too good, but physically, I guess he was okay. I don't know if he bought any food over that time. Greg, it was big news here in L.A. Is that where you are? It seems like a big story. Um, I, I, Andrew, I don't think that he was in the hospital the whole time. I don't, I, um, I don't think – my understanding is that he was found on a street on – February 19th, and then they took him to the hospital. I might have gotten that wrong. But, you know, was it a nervous breakdown? Um, was it drugs? Did he have a bad trip or something like that? Uh, as you're slowly beginning to learn regarding disappearances, there's a strong relationship between drugs and disappearances. Drugs both legal and illegal. Yeah. No, he, he was not. No, my Andrea, my understanding is that uh, somebody saw him, they found his car first, and then somebody saw him not too far away from the car. Somebody called the police. Police showed up. The, the kid was disoriented, and they took him to the hospital. I think that's what happened. So Monday. So we have a week there where nobody seems to know where he was. Um, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the story about this guy that was in New York. We talked about it last week, uh, where the guy was in... Lake Placid, and then all of a sudden he's over in California, and he doesn't know how he got there. Kind of a similar situation. I'm not sure what is going on out there uh, in the world for these things to happen. And I, I guess since last one day, we still don't know what went on with that guy that went from New York to California. I don't know if we'll ever know. It would be nice if we knew. And I don't know if we'll ever know what happened to this Joshua kid either. Of course, their health. It's private information, but from an, investi investi an investigation standpoint and trying to relate it to other disappearances we know about, it would be nice to know. I'm not here to pry into their private lives, but it would be nice to know. I'm just happy that he was found. Uh, at the, I, I think for a while it was looking like uh, he got carjacked or something like that. I am happy that's, that's not the case. Very happy about that. Um, Christina, has anyone heard anything more about the shady? Yeah, I just drew <laughs> ski suit time shift shape shifter. Do we discussed last week? I was uh, thank you, Christina. Well, you and I, um, uh, yeah, great minds think alike, Christina. Um, no, I haven't heard anything, I haven't, and uh, I have to admit, it's been a few days since I looked back into that. But I, I have the idea that we're never going to know unless some truck driver or somebody comes forward and says, Yeah, I, I drove them. I don't know if we're ever going to know, which is just going to continue to make it look suspicious. Um, Joyce, I think it's news seekers, very possible, people looking for attention. And in fact, a, a story that I also saw that I did, poor kid from outside, I would guess bad, drug reaction, be glad he's safe. I'll bet, Christina, I'll bet his wife knows regarding the guy, I'm guessing you mean the guy from Canada who was down here. Christina, you're probably right. Um, speaking, Joyce brings up news seekers. There is a trial going on in Italy about some model who was kidnapped for a while, and her, the, her captors were caught. The captors are saying she put them up to it. Did you, have you seen that? Chloe Whaling or somebody, Chloe is her first name, C-H-L-O-E. Um, are you familiar with that story? Did you see that story? You should look that one up. Um, her captors are claiming that 
it was a scam of some type to get her attention or so she could be on some new show. Dorothy, you saw that story. Uh, if any of you haven't seen it, just do look up uh, Chloe. She was a model uh, in Italy, and you'll probably find the story. Um, so, Joyce, you may be right. People looking for a little attention. That certainly plays a part in this. I'm not sure it played in the part in the Uber driver's case, but uh, there are people out there who are dying for attention and would do something like that, Joyce. So I don't disagree with you at all. But I'm just glad that Joshua Thede uh, was found, and I hope that we can find out what happened to him. The next story uh, that caught my eye, did you happen to see this video of this um, coffee server, a barista, B-A-R-I-S-T-A, a barista? That it, This happened in Kent, Washington. I don't know where that is in the state of Washington. But just a couple mornings ago, she was working alone at like 4.30 in the morning, and some guy actually walked up to the takeout window, jumped in with a knife, and tried to drag her away. Did any of you see that video? Disturbing. Complete, completely, completely disturbing. It's, it's, this coffee place is one of those places where the women kind of dress uh, provocatively. I know bikini place, lingerie place, one of those types of coffee. I'm not into coffee, so I've never been to a place like that. Um, but have any of you seen that video? Uh, I'm just wondering if anybody's seen that. Where am I? Okay, here I am. Um, what is, yeah, a lot like Israel Keys. Yeah, Dorothy, you should look that up. I'm not into coffees or bikinis, Andrew. Okay, Andrew, if you're going to be that way. Um, yes. Jill, you know what? It is, that's exactly, now that you bring that up, Jill, I knew that reminded me of something. Yes, Israel Keys. That's how he eventually got caught. That's right. You know, his reign of terror for however long it was. And um, he got caught going to one of those places. That's exactly right. Thank you, Jill. Ban, Jill, that's that's a good one on your part. Very nice. Um, no, I haven't seen the coffee story. It's out there. Look for it. It's all over the place. Just do barista attacked or something like that on Google. You'll find a video of it. Very disturbing. Uh, Lois hasn't seen an ANC. Yeah, it's a big story within the last 24 hours. But the reason I'm bringing it up is that... Uh, it just shows you how quickly these things. Now, the reason that she, the, I should know if you don't know the story, she survived. She's living. She survived, and they actually caught the guy. He tried. He ran away, but with the video, they were able to uh, figure out who he was. But that, the reason that it, uh, it's important to me um, is that it just shows you how quickly these things can happen. One minute, she's just doing her job at like 4.30 in the morning. You can see it's dark out. And then the next minute, she's being dragged out of that place. I think the reason she wasn't raped and killed was because a car happened to – thank you for posting that. Um, yes, thank you for posting that for everybody. Whoever posted that, thank you. Uh, let me get that. Somebody posted a link there uh, for anybody that wants to uh, see it. I appreciate that. Um, it just shows you how quick things can happen. You know, in a lot of these cases that we've covered on Unfound, we, you know, wonder, man, there's only a few, you know, just a, so many minutes that that could have happened. It just doesn't seem possible. And then you see a video like that and you forget, yeah, it is possible. Yeah, it is possible. If somebody has it in his mind that he wants to do that, maybe he's been scoping the place out for a couple mornings just to see, you know, when it's not busy, first thing in the morning like happened in this case, uh, that's, you know, I guess the perfect time to do it. Um, that's how quickly it can happen. And another car pulled in. If it hadn't happened, I'm sure that this – a uh, young woman, woman would have been raped. 
if not murdered. There, he, guy had a knife. There's no doubt in my mind about that. None. Zero. Zero doubt. And this is why, uh, for all of you uh, women, uh, that you know you, you need to protect yourselves. You need your heads need to be on a swivel when you're leaving a grocery store, leaving a, a department store, leaving work, leaving anywhere, going out anywhere, because um, that's how quickly it can happen. All right. If a guy has an eye on you uh, for whatever reason, whether he's a stranger or your ex-boyfriend, or whoever else, uh, you need to have your head on a swivel, and you can never discount anything at any time. Okay? So uh, that was another story uh, that caught my eye. I want to see. I know somebody posted a link on here, and I wanted to see, make sure that it works. I don't see it now. so weird how this thing works. I just... After doing all this months, it's just a little clunky. Still a little clunky, in my opinion, with Facebook Live. So you can uh, look that story up. Uh, the bikini barista attack guy came through the window. It just shows you how quickly it, it can all happen. There, Christina, you posted it. Thank you. I finally found it. Okay, you posted. Anybody uh, see Christina's comment there from YouTube? I uh, deeply appreciate you uh, posting that so everybody can see um, what I mean by that attack and how quickly it happens. Now, why the guy didn't wear a mask, I have no idea, but, but that's how quickly it can happen. Uh, I want to take a question now. I'm going to take it from Stephanie, and then I want to cover one more true crime item in the, the news, uh, and then we are going to go into this week's case. Um. Stephanie asked me, what question, what disappearance, um, Lois, it's right below uh, your comment there. Christina posted it. It's just a little weird how this all works. Um, but don't worry, Lois. I will post it in the group after we're done, even if you can't see it there. Uh, I will post it in the group and so you can check it out. Or you can just do a Google search while we're, we're, while we're talking here tonight. You can do that too. Just do a search for barista attacked on google and it's going to come right up it's going to come right up uh holly oh hello i didn't see you join us tonight holly how are you doing um and everybody say hi to james maxwell i crew urged him to join he's awesome all right james maxwell i don't know you but thanks for watching uh we can't see it until the live is over i think andrew andrew says okay okay uh either way whatever it is I will post the link on the page and in the group after we're done so everybody can so everybody can see it. All right. I'm um, sorry I talked about something that some of you didn't know about, but uh, it's I think it's an important story. This barista being attacked is an important story for uh, what we do on Unfound. He just got here, Holly. Well, that's fine. You'll ca you can catch the beginning of the show later uh, when I post it on YouTube. Um uh, James, you're welcome. Uh, Stephanie had asked me before the show started, um, what question uh, about a case weighed on your mind and is it still on your mind? I'm, I'm guessing that uh, about any disappearance case, uh, Stephanie, and to the rest of you, I think it's the Stephen Kocher case. Um, I mean, anybody knows, if any of you have listened to the episode that is posted at unfoundpodcast.com, I don't mention that site enough. But if you signed up for the newsletter, then you have uh, you got access to um, that episode, and I hope you've all listened to it. If you haven't, please go to unfoundpodcast.com right now or after the show and do that. Uh, Stephanie, I would have to say that's the case because it happened so close to where I was living at the time in Las Vegas. Although I have a, still have a pretty good idea, as if anybody listens to that episode that I did, it was just me talking, there's no interview. Um, I have a pretty good idea of what happened. I think there's still a lot we don't understand about that disappearance. You know, what, how did that all work? Um, but it, it, you know, I have to admit it was a little creepy for me for a time living so close, going up there to that street, seeing where his car was parked, walking that street, um, going to the different locations where he, he was, where his cell phone was 
bouncing off the different towers and everything. Um, it was, you know, it was creepy for a while. And uh, so there's still those, still some questions in my mind as to how that all went. This is once again, another one of those situations where if that was a, a disappearance that could be solved, I think what we could, we could learn, what we could learn from that disappearance could be applied to other cases. And we would probably get some more insight into cases like that where men or women are lured. I think it would just be one little more piece of information, not just solved for the family. Of course, that's the most important part. And whoever did it needs to be brought to justice. But for those of us who study this stuff, want to learn more about it so other cases can be solved, then um, learning as much as we could about Stephen's disappearance would help us on other cases. There's no doubt in my mind about that. So I would have to say that just, um, once again, just because I lived in Las Vegas, I remember that week when it happened in November of 2009 or December of 2009, I should say December of 2009. And, uh, you know, I kind of remember that time. It seems like yesterday it's going to be, it's over eight years now, man. It seems like yesterday, honestly. Oh my. Um, so that would be the answer to that. Uh, Stephanie, that Stephen Kocher, I have a lot of, still have a lot of questions about it, even though um, I'm pretty sure I know what happened. You know, how exactly did they go about fooling him to show up and park on that street and everything else? Those are, what, those are answers. Those answers I really want to know. I really want to know them. So there you go. Uh, one more true crime uh, piece of news. This is also a uh, story that popped up within the last 24 hours. So if you didn't see it, don't feel bad. There was a, uh, a federal prosecutor, or a, a, a prosecutor, I don't know if he was a federal prosecutor, but he was murdered in 2001 in the state of Washington. His name is Tom Wales, W-A-L-E-S. And I have to believe that the reward for solving his murder is the highest of any private citizen in the United States. This happened in 2001. He was uh, sitting at, he was at his office, which was in the basement of his house back in 2001. There was a window right there by the, the basement window right by his office. He was working in his computer or something. He was shot twice through the window and killed. Uh, what's interesting about that is that his house had motion sensors. You know, people have motion sensors. You probably have it on your own house. People come within so many feet of your house and the, like a spotlight comes on or something like that. In this case, those motion sensors never picked anybody up. So whoever was able to creep around his yard at night knew where those sensors were, knew how to avoid them, got up to that window and shot him twice and killed him. Well, the reward money has just gone up again. And like I said, this has to be the highest reward for any private citizen in the United States. A reward, uh, any information that leads to the solving of his case, $1.52 million is the reward. That's quite a bit for a private citizen, quite a bit. And we know that rewards, of course, rarely um, work, uh, unfortunately. But um, for a private citizen, that is a lot of money. I mean, $100,000 is a lot of money to solve a case for a private citizen. You know, he wasn't like a governor or a senator or some famous actor or anybody like that. Um, $1.52 million is the reward now. It just went up. The reason it's in the news is because the reward went up again. Uh, let's see. That's, uh, Becca says, I think there's a podcast about this case. I've only listened to one episode, but it's interesting. I think it's called Somebody Somewhere. That could be. That could be very well. And I can understand why somebody would do uh, a podcast about this. I can completely understand it. Um, but it caught my eye just because of the reward money, which is incredible. Um, 
So whoever killed him would have had to have known that he worked at his office at night, sitting there. Like I, I mean, you can't see it, but where I'm looking out. Excuse me, I'm going to shut the air conditioning off. My air conditioning unit just kicked on, and you won't be able to hear me if it kicks on. Um, like where I'm facing right now is my front window. So somebody, I guess, could come by here and shoot me. Let's hope not. And uh, somebody must have known that he worked at that time uh, for that, uh, you know, at that time and wanted him dead and then also knew about the motion sensors around his house. And I'm sure if this podcast is covering that, then maybe you know a little bit more about it. There it was an airline pilot who lived in the area, is still a main suspect. And, in fact, the information that I read today says that it, uh, they do believe uh, that there's some sort of conspiracy. There is a group, a small group of people who were involved in the murder of this guy. And, but, they do, but they do believe that whoever actually shot him was a professional killer. But they believe it was started by some pilot who was angry about some tax case that Tom Wells had worked on uh, that this pilot got in trouble for. So Tom Wells, this was way back from 2001. So the case is 17 years old. So uh, I guess there's a podcast about it. Didn't know that. It makes total sense to me uh, that there is. And... Um, and that's so crazy, Angela. Yes, this is crazy, but I read the FBI has an idea who's involved. I read that too. I guess the then the question is, why don't they just go pick and pe pick these people up? What are they waiting for? I don't know. Andrew says that's crazy. I can't even avoid my own motion sensors. Yeah, Andrew, it is interesting, isn't it? Um I like I said, what I know about the case is just a couple articles I read today. Obviously, if there's somebody doing a podcast on it, that post uh, knows way more about it than I do. Um, it does get you to thinking, though. You, you know me. I always start looking at people closest to the person instead of looking at any business partners. I like to look at boyfriends, girlfriends, people like that. So don't know. Just don't know. So there was, the, there was that that popped up as well. So we've covered a little true crime news tonight. We talked about the Uber Lyft driver who was found. We talked about the bikini barista who almost uh, was attacked, but she survived. And the perpetrator was caught. Wanted to talk about that because of showing how quickly bad things can happen. And then I wanted to talk about Tom Wells. So that brings us to this week's case. And that is the disappearance of Rebecca Henderson Polk. She disappeared on September 8th, 2015, so it's a relatively new case. Um, she disappeared from Demopolis, Alabama, which is in the western uh, part of Alabama near the Mississippi border. And the reason that's important is because her car was found over in Mississippi. It was found on a logging road where her kind of car had no business being, only four-wheel drive vehicles uh, should have been there. My understanding is that the reason the car was found in this road is it was stuck. Somebody was trying to drive that car back that road and got stuck. It wasn't, the car technically wasn't left there. I think the person wanted to drive this car even deeper into the woods, but happened to get stuck where the car ended up. And Holly, you're from Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. But uh, the interview for this episode is with her uh, mother, Janet. You should know this is uh, an episode that I've been working on for a while, maybe since November. Yes, really. Um, the reason it's taken a little long and, oh, from Alabama? Okay. Well, then you maybe have heard about the case, Holly. Uh, disappearance of Rebecca Henderson Polk. Um, It's taken me so a while because Janet, uh, her mother, who once again is the interview for this episode, uh, wanted me to talk to a couple people who knew Rebecca. Uh, Janet thought that these people would be helpful. One of them, I'm not going to mention any names, one of them was very helpful, very helpful. And I thank this person for assisting me in the episode. However, what also is interesting about this episode is this is the first time 
where I was uh, referenced, told to talk to somebody, and this person held on on me. The person, uh, how do I want to put this? Talk to this person for about an hour. And this per- and, and Janet, you should know, Janet knows about this. She already knows. She knows us. I'm not, she's, she knows. Person I thought was being helpful. And then I started, I think, I think this person uh, slipped on saying something. And then I started in on that questioning, and suddenly she didn't want to say anything anymore. There it is. I gave it away. It's a she. Um, she didn't want to say anything anymore. And she, um, I kept asking her about a name, and she didn't want to tell me what the name is. Suddenly she acted like she didn't know who I was. This actually happened. So we're having a great conversation. She's going on and on. And then she says something. I go in on that line of questioning and then she uh, starts saying, well, I don't know who you are. You could, you don't, you know, suddenly she's, I mean, she talked to me in for an hour. This actually happened. No, uh, this person is not on the episode. No, I'm not giving away this person's name. Uh, Do I think that this person is involved? No, I don't, Becca. No, I don't. I want to say that for record. I do not. But what it shows me is that there are things going on in this case kind of underneath everything. It seems uh, Demopolis is a small town uh, where Rebecca's car was found is a small town. And uh, I think there's still some fear that is running. Th- Remember, this is a disappearance that is only two and a half years old. But there is still a lot of fear running through this town because of this disappearance. Holly, do I think she knows something, this person I talked to? Um, I wouldn't go that far. All I'm saying is that I don't think that she wanted to mention a person's name because this person that I talked to was maybe fearful for her life if she did. Okay? That's what I think. That's one of the – I have another suspicion. I don't know it. I'm just going to leave it at that. But do I think that this person is involved in – uh, Jennifer's dis- or Rebecca's disappearance? No, I don't. No, I don't. Um, but I have some other ideas on top of the fact that, I mean, this person, you can just, I'm just telling you what happened. This person was talking to me. I, I thought trying to be helpful. And as soon as, once again, I think that she slipped up. She said something I think she didn't want to say. And when I started asking her about it, she started throwing up all these brick walls in front of me. That happened. First time in a year and a half and that that's happened in any of the conversations I've ever had. So that has also delayed this episode getting done. This, this, and once again, I told Janet about this um, as soon as it happened. That night when it happened, I called Janet up and told her. And she knows who the person is. Um, uh, Holly says, I can understand. I grew up in a small town. Everyone knows everyone, every, everything about you. But the thing is, I was never going to mention this person's name, and I'm still not mentioning her name. I'm still not saying, telling, uh, Janet knows who it is, but I'm not, I'm not going to tell any of you who it is. So her, this person's identity it was going to be a secret no matter what, no matter what. And uh, do they retract their permission to publish the interview or do you make that decision to pull it? Well, this isn't the person, no, 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 no. Uh, This isn't Janet, uh, Rebecca's mother, who is the actual interview for the episode. This is somebody Janet wanted me to talk to and I did. And uh, this, once again, this person I thought was being helpful and I talked to them, I guess, just long enough for them to say something they didn't want to say. Uh, Janet, I think, was a little stunned by this, but that's why we had to, you know, I had to wait for that. I had to wait for the, the person who was helpful to get through, them, say, through some things that that person was doing. That person was very helpful, uh, but this other person was not. So, um, first time, I thought you might find that all interesting. And so 
once again, there's something, I think that this is, uh, I have a prediction in this case that one of the things that's hurting this case right now, getting it solved, is because it's so new. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I think with time, I think people are going to open up. But just from that one person's behavior leads me to believe there's probably a lot of other people who don't want to say anything at this point. They know something and don't want to say anything because um, – now, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, out of a year and a half, not bad. Um, Holly, it doesn't matter in small towns. She might worry someone hearing something. Maybe. That's possible, Holly. Now, don't get me wrong. I think I finally found out the person that she didn't want to mention. All right, I think I finally figured it out. And you will hear that person's name in my summation. It does not come up during the interview. It comes up in my summation afterwards. I think that this is a person uh, that this informant or whoever uh, didn't want to tell me. I think. I'm pretty, pretty sure. So you, once again, you will have to judge that all for yourselves, but I, I want you to know that um, this is the first time that's happened, where I actually talked to somebody that showed a little fear, uh, was trying, I think that the person was trying to get out of the interview without saying anything important, and then, as is it with the case with anything, you let a person talk long enough, they're eventually going to say something that's going to get them in trouble. So I'm not uh, revealing this person's identity, the person that I talked to, but I will mention who I think this person meant. I am going to do that, and there's nothing that can stop me to do that. And um, that's, the, that's what we do on MFound. We name names. That's what we do. So uh, there you go. Um, now in her case, in Rebecca's case, how did it end? They, they hang up. Uh, Holly, that's a good question. No, they did not hang up on me. Uh, I just told the person that it bothers me when people don't want to tell me names when I know that I can be trusted. And I told this person that I'm not going to try to stop figuring out who this person means, but they don't want to say who the name is. And I stuck my word, stuck to it. I told them I'm going to find out who I think you mean. And I think I did. It took some time. Like I said, it took about two months. <laughs> so um, that's what I do for this program because I think that the public has a right to know who these people are. Uh, now, once makes this this you know now the other part of this is maybe if you're maybe reading between the lines, Rebecca was involved with some suspicious people. She I think was doing some drugs. She had friends who were drug dealers and druggies themselves. Um, and that may have played a part in her disappearance, but I think that there are other possibilities here uh, besides that. And you will have to judge that for yourself. I mean, there was a guy seen driving her car, but then later she's seen driving her own car. Um, she had a violent boyfriend at the time, but nobody can put the boyfriend in the area where Rebecca was at the time that she disappeared. So once again, uh, like with any case, you will have to judge it. Uh, on its own merits. So um, it, it's a case that's two and a half years old. Um, I, I think it's a good one, but this is one of those ones. Some cases come together fairly quickly. This one took a little time to put together from so, for some of the reasons that I al already mentioned. Uh, a delay because of somebody holding out on me and then the delay of getting to talk to somebody else um, who had to get through some things before we could make some time to talk. And once again, once I talked to that person, this, that person uh, was very, very helpful. Uh, actually gave me, actually told me a couple things that not even Janet knew, and I, we were able to add those into the interview. So it was good. I, I'm glad I waited. But it's the disappearance of Rebecca Henderson Polk. The title of the episode is going to be Over the Line. And she disappeared from Demopolis, Alabama. Her car found in Why Not, Mississippi on September 8th, 2015. Um, that's about all I have uh, for tonight's show. Uh, man, we had some good conversation tonight, some good questions, some good back and forth. 
what did we talk about? We talked about uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind was the movie tonight in the pre-show. Talked about how he stunk it up <clears throat> this weekend on disc golf. Really stunk it up. Talked about the TribLive.com article that's coming out this weekend that I, that I helped on. The disappearance of Tony Lynn McNatt Chiapetta, who disappeared from Clareton, Pennsylvania in 1981. I'll be linking to that when it comes out. I talked about why you never hear about psychics on the program. I did the business, Amazon.com, MakePlayingCards.com, Shopify.com, all of the merchandise there and books there. My Patreon account, uh, the PayPal account for Unfound, the Unfound newsletter. If you want to get on the list, email me. Um, let's see, maybe she will listen to the con. And, uh, Dorothy, uh, she, uh, the person who held on me, Dorothy, she is welcome to contact me anytime if she wants to tell me. I always leave the door open to anybody, all right? Always do, okay? But I did I did tell this person that people are going to know. I'm not going to mention her name, but I'm going to tell people that somebody held out on me for this episode. I She knew that. So we talked about the Uber slash Lyft driver who was found after a week. We talked about the big the barista in the bikini or whatever she was wearing who got attacked. But it uh, just shows you how quickly bad things can happen. We talked about the unsolved murder uh, of Tom Wells from 2001, where the reward is $1.252 million. And then we talked about this coming Friday's episode, uh, the disappearance of Rebecca Henderson Polk from Demopolis, <coughs> Alabama, September 8th, 2015. The title of that episode is called Over the Line. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to leave you for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, this is my favorite part of the week, every week, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, where I get to talk to all of you. I, pl I, I appreciate it. You take the time out of your evening or night uh, to tune in. Uh, how old is uh, uh, Rebecca? Um, I don't have her age written down here. She was in her late 20s. She was in her late 20s. Uh, I believe. Uh, I think she's 20. She was 26, I think, when she disappeared, I think. I just don't have it written down here. Um, you're welcome to everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, for any of you who tuned in late, it will be up on YouTube uh, before the night is out, and you will hear my voice on Friday. And I thank you all. It's great uh, hearing uh, from all of you tonight. You've been watching the Unfound Podcast Facebook Live show for for February 21st. 2018. Good night.